Hello, my name is Avril Sorter and you're watching the course titled Conducting Cisco Wireless Site Survey. In this lesson, we're going to be discussing some of the basic concepts of how wireless actually works. Now, over the years, I've actually been quite surprised how many professionals deploy wireless network without a firm grasp of how wireless actually works. This has often resulted in some problems that have actually been very costly and very time consuming to resolve. So in this lesson, we're really trying to set that foundation for how the basics of a radio works. And then we can draw the implications as to what that means for you actually conducting the site survey. So this lesson is broken up into three major parts. We're first going to take a look at the frequency spectrum. So we're going to talk about what is the range of spectrum and what is the implications for operating at different frequency bands. We're going to talk about channel frequencies and channel bandwidth and make sure you're very comfortable with that terminology. Then we will discuss what it actually means when you're planning out your network and how do you choose which frequency that you're actually going to deploy an access point on. Once we have a grasp of understanding the frequencies and the channel bandwidths, then we're going to take a look at the digital radio itself and the major components, which is the coding of the signal and then the modulation of the signal over the air. And we'll talk about what modulation and coding schemes are. Once we've done that, we're then going to take a look at a demonstration and we're actually going to take a look at some signals over the air and talk about some key terminology such as receive signal strength. So let's start with our discussions on spectrum considerations. Now the word spectrum has been around for hundreds of years and was first introduced to describe the effects of light when you observe that light going through a prism disperses and gives you that wonderful rainbow of colors. And so the very first uses of spectrum was really to describe light. And we talked about spectrum in terms of frequency and wavelength. And the first thing to note is that frequency and wavelength are actually inversely proportional, which means that as the frequencies increase, the wavelength of those signals actually decreases. And so that's what you can see on the chart at the bottom. As the frequencies increase, the wavelength actually gets smaller. And that's important to understand a little bit later on when we start talking about antennas. Now, the term spectrum can actually be applied to not only to light, but to all waves. Now, when we're talking about radio waves, we're really talking about frequencies which could be as low as something like 3 kilohertz to as much as 300 gigahertz. Now, waveforms such as light actually are naturally occurring, but for radio, we actually artificially generate those radio waves. And we do that in all sorts of networks, including your cellular mobile networks and your satellite networks, and of course, in our Wi-Fi network as well. Now, the spectrum is actually regulated. Here in the United States, the spectrum regulation is controlled by the FCC, the Federal Communication Commission, and also the NTIA, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. And that spectrum may be licensed or it may be unlicensed or sometimes referred to as license exempt. Now, if you were looking at the cellular systems, for instance, uh, around the world that operates in the 800, 900 megahertz band, as well as the 1800 and 1900 megahertz bands, and those bands are licensed, which means only the cellular operators can operate in that spectrum band. However, Wi-Fi, which is a subject of our course, operates in the unlicensed band, which means that Wi-Fi can operate in that band and other technologies can also operate in that band and that you do not require a license to actually deploy and implement that technology. 
So what we're creating is these radio waves which will propagate out from our antenna. And what happens is that signal will be reflected, it'll get absorbed, all sorts of things will happen to it. And what happens to it is actually dependent on the frequency that you're transmitting on. Now, at lower frequencies, the wavelength is actually larger, and therefore the radio waves will have an easier time going through obstacles such as brick, stone, even water. It'll be able to propagate through a little bit easier than if you're operating up at the higher frequencies. And absorption is an important consideration when we look at what happens to the signal over the air. Also, the way it reflects and diffracts off obstacles will also be dependent on the frequency that you're transmitting at. And so we have general rules of behavior, which is important to understand, because when we are deploying our Wi-Fi networks, we're going to be deploying them both in the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz band, and our radios actually behave differently in those bands because it's different frequencies. And so the lower the frequency, the greater the propagation. What that means is that if I'm operating at 2.4 gigahertz in comparison with 5 gigahertz, my signal will go much further for the same transmitted power. The lower frequencies also have a much greater penetration through walls. So again, if I'm deploying an access point in the 2.4 gigahertz band, in comparison with deploying the access point in 5 gigahertz band, my ability to go through cubicles and wall constructions will be a lot better. Now, often I'm deploying a dual mode access point, which will, I want to have it operating on both the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz band. And so how do I cater for that when I've got my 2.4, which will have signals that travel much further and penetrate through walls much better than my radios operating on the 5 gigahertz band? Some of the techniques I can use is maybe I can reduce down the power level on the 2.4 gigahertz to reduce down the coverage area. The other thing I can do is I can use a higher gain antenna on the 5 gigahertz band, perhaps to change the propagation characteristics, the coverage characteristics of my cell coverage. The main thing you need to remember at this point in time is that if you're deploying a dual mode access point that's operating in both the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz band, you need to do a site survey in both bands. You cannot do a site survey in just the 2.4 and then make assumptions about the operations in the 5 gigahertz band. Now to take a closer look at spectrum issues, I want to go through what the spectrum looks like in the 2.4 gigahertz band and this will give you a good feeling for the terminology as well as how the spectrum is being utilized. So in North America there is 79 megahertz of spectrum available in the 2.4 gigahertz band where I can deploy Wi-Fi or other devices such as Bluetooth, cordless phones, etc. Because remember, this is an unlicensed band, so I can deploy different technologies. Now, if we look at this 79 megahertz of spectrum, how the 80211 Wi-Fi standard has defined is to slice it up into 11 channels, channels 1 to 11. Now when you look at this picture you can say to me, Avril, there's channels 12, 13 and 14. Now that's to cater for international spectrum because different countries around the world have different amounts of spectrum available. So for instance in Europe they actually have 13 channels that are defined. When I deploy my Wi-Fi network, I need to choose for my access point in the 2.4 gigahertz band which channel I want to deploy it on. And I can choose channel 1, 2, 3, etc. Now if I deploy one access point on channel 1 and an adjoining access point on channel 2, you can see that the spectrum overlaps. And this will cause significant interference. 
So when I'm deploying my Wi-Fi network at the 2.4 gigahertz band, what I want to do is I want to choose channels that are not overlapping. And you can see in this picture, that would be channels 1, 6, and 11. Now, if I was in Europe and had 13 channels available, then I'd actually deploy on 1, 7, and 13, because I want to maximize the separation between these channels in order to avoid interference. Now, one of the biggest mistakes that I see people make is they assume, oh, Wi-Fi has all of these channels, and therefore they just pick a channel in order to deploy their access point without being aware of what's going on around them. And so one of the most important things to make a decision on is what frequency and what channel are you going to deploy your access points on. Now before we leave this slide, I just want to show you that the separation between channel 1 and channel 6 in this illustration is 25 megahertz. And this would be the case of most deployments here in the United States. Slightly larger channel separation if you're in Europe because you'd be using 1, 7, and 11. The reason I want to point out that channel separation is I'm going to come back to that uh, in a later slide. So please bear that in mind and remember that. So remember I said the biggest mistake I've seen is when someone will just choose one of those channels without realizing that they actually overlap. So this is actually a real life demonstration that I took a few months ago when I was staying at a hotel in Denver. And you can see here that clearly a site survey wasn't done. And if you ever go and visit this hotel, it's really interesting about Every other hotel door room has an access point above it. And so what Sawan has thought is, well, the more access points I deploy, then obviously the better my coverage, the better my throughput. And they've just randomly chosen these channels, one, two, three, etc. What they haven't realized is these channels are overlapping. And you can see here, for instance, signals transmitted on channel 1, here illustrated in the first red um, signal that you can see, and then channel 2, here shown in the green. You can see that they're quite clearly overlapping, and that's going to cause a major degradation if you have users transmitting on those two channels at the same time. And so here's a classic case where people have deployed lots of access points on lots of different channels, thinking this was the right thing to do. But in fact, they've deployed more access points than they need to. So the cost of their deployment is much higher than it needs. And the actual performance of this network is actually worse because of these overlapping channels than if they just done a site survey and worked out how many access points they need and then deploy those access points on non-overlapping channels, which in this case, because it's in the United States, would be channels 1, 6, and 11. Now, one of those things that you would have seen in that previous slide is that when I deploy my access point at a specific frequency, that signal actually occupies a bandwidth, and we call that the channel bandwidth. So not only do I care about what frequency do I deploy in, I care about what the signal channel bandwidth is. Now, when I'm deploying 802.11b years ago, that extremely popular technology that's taken off around the world, and in fact was the reason why Wi-Fi has become the de facto standard for wireless LAN deployments, that is deployed in the 2.4 gigahertz band, and the signal actually occupies a 22 megahertz channel. That's using what's referred to as a direct sequence spread spectrum radio. When I move to A and G, I move to an OFDM radio. And